Hello everyone, my name is Paul Third, and today I'm going to talk about a controversial topic, I know, <laughs> it's not surprising when it's Paul Third, and that topic today is audio gear shaming, and I'm going to discuss why I think it's completely idiotic, and why it's important that you learn, especially if you're at the start of your audio journey, to learn to block all of that out, and to focus on what is important in your career. I'm going to use this studio as it's nearly like it's 98% finished. It's going to be opened very, very, very soon. I'm going to discuss certain decisions that I made where I was kind of battling with what the internet was going to say and, you know, what other engineers were going to say and how uh, my studio was going to be perceived. And basically, I felt a lot of potential shame if I was to go down certain routes. There'll be certain things in here that you would expect me to talk about, but I don't want to talk about them because I don't think that it's important for you starting out. But I think in terms of the control room, the biggest decision that I've made that is going to be quite controversial, but I know I've made the right decision for me, is that I decided to swap out the Universal Audio Apollo X6 interface for the Audion Evo 16. Now, there is a £1,200 <laughs> difference. The Evo 16 is £400. The, Evo, the um, Apollo X6 is £1,600. Now, this was a decision that I thought long and hard about because there were many things that I liked about the Apollo, but over time I realised that the thing that I liked most about the Apollo was how it was perceived. I liked the fact that people, you know, perceived it as a, like a studio grade interface and it's got this prestige to it and that was all fine and well however essentially I wasn't getting the most out of it because of my specific needs so if we think about the fact that I'm a Windows man and that system just doesn't work well with Windows well my Windows setup anyway there's Thunderbolt issues I'm still having to well I was because I'm not anymore but I was still having to restart my computer every time I switched it on so the x6 wouldn't connect to my Windows setup on the first boot. I just have to restart the computer and nine times out of 10, it would connect. Many people will buy an Apollo X6 because they want to utilize the, the, the plug-in DSP they, and they want to track on the way in. Obviously the X6 has two Apollo preamps and you could utilize their plugins on the way in via tracking, which many people see as a massive benefit. It just wasn't for me. I actually would rather use the 500 series stuff on the way printing in. I'm not going to go into detail, but there was a few things on the DSP that just didn't sound right to me. And then that kind of, I think it got into my head and I was like, I think there's someone with the DSP that's colouring the sound in the X6 because I don't even like the digital to analog conversion um, in speakers. And DAC to ADC is absolutely fine. It's stellar. It's actually again, one of the best performers you'll get at that price range. But, you know, the digital to analog conversion to speakers, the muddiness in the X6 that I was hearing in the speaker conversion, it was just, I just didn't like it. And it was putting me off and it was kind of making me not want to use the speakers, which obviously I wanted to use. And then you, you kind of get into the whole look back situation because Universal Audio kind of say that, you know, the, the system is meant to be just purely studio based. Unfortunately, we're in the modern world where, you know, we need to look back. When I do the podcast with Ed, like I had to use a different interface. So I had a £1,600 interface and I still had to use a different interface with Riverside, which is what we use for the podcast. If I'm doing a Zoom call or whatever, I could never use the Apollo. I could, but I would have to use Voice Meter Banana and a, a third-party software called Jack Router. But with going through all of that, the latency was crazy. So I was always lagging behind. What it meant was that when I was working with that interface. I wasn't working as effectively and efficiently as I wanted to. And add to the fact that I, not all the time, but maybe like maybe once every two months, I was getting a proper hard crash where the Apollo would just crash Windows. And it was that bad of a crash that I couldn't even switch the computer on and off. And I remember the first time it happened, I was like, oh my God, this my computer's broke. And I had to disconnect the Apollo, power everything off, power everything on again, and then the computer worked and then I had to go through the whole scenario of plugging the Apollo back in and getting it to connect and it's happened I don't know maybe six times in like maybe a year and a half or whatever that I've had it and that's a worry for me because it's intermittent and if that happens in a session I'm snookered 
and it, and I would never want that to happen with a client in the room because you imagine they're recording, they're doing a perfect take and my system crashes on me. It's just not a risk that I could take. And then probably the, the probably the icing on the cake, um, or probably the shit on <laughs> shit on the cake was that the X6 has smucks ADA, which basically means that it's limited to eight uh, channels of ADA, but you can split uh, over two ADA channels in 96k. But it's not that you get two full channels of eight channel ADA. It's that the eight channel ADA gets split into four. So for my 500 series that's there in the SPA, I would only be able to use four pieces of gear and I would only be able to use four inputs in the live room of the SPA. With the EVO 16, you've got two proper channels of ADA. So what I've got in here is I've got the SP8 in the live room connected over a 10 meter ADA cable. It genuinely just <laughs> goes like right along the walls, all the way along to the studio, into the live room. Works absolutely perfect. So I've got eight in there, and then I've got the other eight channels running to the other SP8, which is powering the 500 series rack here. And the EVO 16 is powering the other 500 series rack. So I've got two 500 series racks that I basically use for tracking. And if I want to use the odd compressor or channel strip in a mix, if I'm running low on CPU, then I, I can utilize them, which is pretty handy. And in regards to the Windows compatibility, everything just works the way that I need it to work. I switch it on and everything's there. And I've got, I've got a template and a preset that I use in the EVO software. I've got my alt monitors selected. So I've got the Presonus Era Studio 8s that I use for tracking because I've got a really wide uh, sweet spot. And I've got these out of the kind of equilateral triangles. So they're wider in my desk, which makes it perfect for tracking. So I could have at least, you know, three or four people in here in different bitties, in different areas, and they're basically going to get the same experience, which I think is very important for tracking. And I've got the Kali INUNF as the alt speaker, and I can just easily switch between, which you could do on the Apollo XX as well. It's just that I didn't really like the Apollo XX conversion. The uh, Audient DAC to speaker conversion, I think, is better. It's not as good as the DX7 Pro Plus, but again, the, the DX7 Pro Plus is a luxury. Then I use that for the Kali IN5s that I've got in the near field position. And again, it's a pair of three ways and I love them, but I don't necessarily need them. Essentially, I don't even need the other SP8 for the other 500 series rack, but <laughs> I didn't want to leave the desk slot empty because I didn't want people to come in. And, it, and it, I don't know, again, it's like audio shame and it's like, got that empty rack. Like, it just doesn't look nice. And I've generally got stuff from Bart Herc <laughs> just to fill that other space. So again, it's a, it's a little bit needless, but again, you know, if it's that thing where I want to advance the studio and, and I get the opportunity to get kind of more pieces, maybe more preamps, maybe some, a few radial kind of DI boxes or anything like that, you know, just things I could add in that help me with tracking, then I've got that scope to kind of modify my setup over, over time. But I, I wasn't getting that with the XX. I just didn't have that adaptability because it's really the X6 is made to kind of work best in an Apollo setup. And that's not something that I wanted. It's not something that I needed. It's not something that I wanted to invest in. So genuinely, I know it sounds surprising to many people, but the Evo 16 in every way suits me to the ground and actually makes me a better professional because I work more efficiently. Even just tiny things like how the X6 has a talkback mic in it, but it, it was all over, it's way over there. And I was like, people can't really hear me and it sounds a bit shit. But with the Evo 16, you can use an external USB mic and Ed sent me one of his. And what's great about that is I could have a way better talkback mic, have it like kind of just tucked away. And then when I'm recording, people could properly hear me. And because it's an external USB mic, you're not using any of your inputs on your SP or your Evo 16, which again is another handy feature. Again, it's just these things that just suited me. I'm not saying the X6 is a shit interface. There's a reason why it costs what it costs. It's just that with the Audion Evo system, everything just works exactly the way that I need it to work. Even just the fact that all the, the Evo system setup has all the smart gain on them. So I've got the smart gain in the live room. But the great thing is with the EVO system is that the SPA links with the EVO 16 and because it's all digitally controlled preamps, I can control the preamps from the control room. 
So I can control the preamps in the live room from the control room. I could switch off phantom power. I could like change the gains, which again, just makes my life easier and it works better from a workflow perspective when I'm thinking about having a client in the live room and I'm not going back and forth, back and forth. It's a great unit. The only issue is, is the price. And many people will go, oh, it's Audion. Oh, it's like 400 pounds. I'm like, who cares? Like I had a 1600 pound unit and it wasn't working the way I needed it to work. I want clients to come into the studio and things just work. There's no faff and it's like, right, I know where my speakers are connected. I've got my talk back mic sorted. I know it's going to sound clear. I've got my headphone stuff routed in. Everything just works. All I need is 24 in and 24 out. And that's what I've got. And I can get that from a 1200 pound system. So I've completely waffled and spoken way longer about that <laughs> than I wanted to. But yeah, that's the reason why I made a specific decision to downgrade my main interface, the main hub of this control room and recording space to an interface that costs 1200 pound less than what I already had. Right, so we've done the control room. Let's move on to the live room. Now, the things that I felt personally that I needed in the live room was obviously the SP8, which we've talking about, which is obviously getting routed in the control room via the Evo 16, you know. So I've got that sorted. I've got the microphones, I've got the cables, but instruments was the thing that I was really kind of like, I need some instruments in there because if I'm going to kind of treat this as a space where people are going to come in as a creative space and want to record, you need to have a few instruments in there. So obviously I've got my two Gretches that I'm begrudgingly going to allow <laughs> people to play because they are beautiful. I've got a Les Paul that I'm away to bring in. I've got uh, an acoustic guitar, an Epiphone Dove, but I didn't have a piano and I was going to get a real like acoustic piano. And I, a long story short, I got screwed over for delivery and I ended up not going for it. And then I spoke to a piano teacher and he just said to me, Paul, he went, that's the best decision you could make is to not buy an acoustic piano. I mean, I know that like there's a whole romanticism about it and people don't like digital, but Paul, digital is getting really, really good these days. And at the end of the day, you're, you're going to mic it up. And again, it's not going to sound great. When, when, how old was it? I was like, fucking 1907. It's like, Paul, it was built in 1907. It's like, Paul, when the keys will be short. I went, I'll need properly tuned and you'll need to tune it all the time. Why don't you just get a piano that's perfectly in tune? People can come in, switch it on and they can just play to their heart's desire. And you could just like put it into your interface and then record it in the live room. The audio shame part of me was thinking, but I need to get a real piano. I need to get a real piano and real mics. But from, you know, a professional point of view in terms of a working studio, having the digital piano actually works better for me. I've got them connected to two little small speakers <laughs> that I was given in LA because I think the, the the stock speaker in it sounds absolutely shit. And I have done something very unorthodox and I don't advise this any other, any other time. I have taken the headphone out and I've went TRS to uh, RCA <laughs> into the, the two little speakers. It just sounds better when you're playing it live and it sounds a little bit less digital. Yes, you, you have to worry a little bit with distortion if you, if you push into it too loud, but it sounds better, right? But having the digital piano gives me a lot more kind of scope to be able to do more because what that allows me to do is, you know, an artist can have, you know, the pianos, you know, on the headphones and I could record their voice and, you know, like I don't have any bleed. I could connect the piano and route it into here if I'm the way of doing that. And again, so I could have the piano coming in here and them recording their vocal. And again, I don't have to deal with any bleed. And the great thing is I can again record it as MIDI and I could I can change the piano sample. So I could have that piano sound and I could change the piano sound in post. The artist could say, no, I just don't like that that stock kind of I can't remember what it is. The Yamaha's YDPs have their flagship grand piano. Again, they might want more of a kind of laid back, kind of more of a kind of rolled off acoustic piano sound or they just want a different piano sound we could do that and change it where with the acoustic piano it was one sound and you were forced it and if they didn't like it and it was out of tune <laughs> then it was like that's it and they're like well i'm not going to use you for fucking recording piano then so as much as you know the audio purist in me was like ah acoustic piano is better it wasn't what i needed what i needed was just to have a piano in there and then the last thing in the live room which i bought last week with the money <laughs> that i am using for the x6 I decided to buy a parlor acoustic guitar. Now, many people may be surprised by that because 
many people don't like parlor guitars. Many people like the five grand Gibsons, you know, like the big massive fucking, can't remember the J's or whatever they're called. I, I played it in the guitar shop and hated them. I hate these five grand massive style guitars because they're just bass, 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 bass heavy, don't sound great. And I just picked up this Gretsch and people will look at it and be like, oh my God, that's so garish. My wife loved it, um, but I'm a Gretsch man. So I don't know if it was just like me being Gretsch, I was drawn to it. And picked it up and I was like, oh, uh, this is the sound. This is the sound that I'm, that I'm being after. Because the thing is about a parlor guitar is that it's smaller and it, it sounds more focused, almost like it's got its like self-compression. I find it great for uh, finger picking. Like if you're looking for like an open strum, that's why I've got the Epiphone Dove. It's a bigger guitar. You get that openness where I think what a parlor guitar can do could be to really help you in production. Because if you're looking for a really tight strummed sound, parlor guitar will do it perfectly. Played it in the guitar shop and straight away I was like, I don't give a shit what anybody else says. Because I, I went online and it was like, people were like, this sounds terrible, terrible. Parlor guitars like this are for beginners. And I was like, oh no, 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 I can't, I can't buy this. I need to get like a big expensive guitar. I need to get a Martin. I need to get a Taylor. And I was like, no, Paul, you like this. This is the sound you want. You know this is going to record well. It's going to give you an option if somebody's looking to like do finger picking stuff for arpeggios. I just know that that sound is going to record really well. And it's giving me more to the artist. And I'm thinking more of the client. And I think that's something that many people these days struggle with, is that they think about themselves, especially mixers. It's very much like, oh, I need to get all this expensive gear and all these expensive preamps and all these expensive compressors and EQs. And it's, and it's all about you looking good. Where, and because I see this as a full studio, I want to focus on the client. And my professionalism is based kind of on my studio. This is like my house. You come in and it's in good nick. It's not a fucking mess. It's tidy. And you walk into my live room, you're like, oh, piano, two Gretches. There's a bass in there. And it's not a Fender bass. It's like a Galari bass that I got sent fucking two years ago. But it plays great. It sounds great. It's cheap, but it does the job that I need it to do. A professional bass player would bring in his own bass. But if an artist is like, oh, you know what? I've decided I want to put some, I want to redo the bass. There's a bass, let's do it. Let's like get that on the track and make some music. I was so worried about what people would think about having a digital piano that I didn't think how much better a digital piano would work in my studio. I was worried about, oh, just are people going to be like, oh, it's a Gretsch and it looks kind of garish and it's like parlor guitars are for kids. It's like, no, 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 no. You know what you want. You know the sound and you know what you need. And hopefully what you're seeing is that I'm thinking more about what I need, not what I want, not the luxuries that I get from YouTube, what I need. And basically everything that I've put my own money into have all been things that I really needed and I prioritized. I paid for all of the acoustical treatment in all three rooms and I treated them as best as I could. This is the one that I, it's such a big room and I ran out of money, but the live room is so well treated, really well treated. And the Atmos room is fucking hell. I don't think I'll ever, ever treat a room better than my Atmos room. Like, it doesn't even matter. The clap test doesn't matter. You're getting nothing out of that room. Like, I mean, I could belt my voice. I could go high levels of uh, SPL. You, nothing back. <laughs> nothing back. It's not an anechoic chamber, obviously, but it is dry. Dry as a camel's sandal. And then lastly... That brings me to the Atmos room. And I think everybody's going to know what the uh, <laughs> the audio shame in me was when I was thinking about the Atmos room. It was obviously the Kali's. Obviously, I've got Kali LP8s in there. There are two ways. Again, I know from like having the Presonus Era Studio 8s and the Kali IN5s in the control room, the three ways do some better. I do definitely prefer three ways to mix on speakers. Like I, I could, like, I could mix, you can mix on anything, but my preference would be to mix on three ways if I was predominantly mixing uh, on speakers. However, the thing about Dolby Atmos is that it's less about the stereo, right? If it's stereo is important, you've got two speakers. They're doing all the heavy lifting. But on Atmos, you've got 12 speakers in my setup, kind of going around the place. So for me, I wasn't as fussed. And at the end of the day, to mix in Dolby Atmos, you don't need expensive monitors. You just need good, decent studio monitors that are going to allow you to place everything in the immersive field. That was all that I needed. But it was a decision that really cut me up because I was like, oh, should I get the IKs? 
the Kalish, oh, because they gave, they offered me a price on the LPs, and I was like, ah, should I pay more for the INs? Oh, should I scrap it and should I should I just go really expensive and put myself into debt just so I have a really really good, you know, Atmos setup? And the more I thought about it, I was like, no, Paul, you just need Atmos. <laughs> like people are going to come in and be fucking blown away by the immersiveness, which people have been. All I had to do was ensure that the room was treated correctly, that I had the right setup to be able to make it work as efficiently as possible, which is why I've got the Audio and Aurea. That thing is an absolute dream. I don't even think twice. I don't even think twice about it when I'm in the room. I just switch it on, buff, buff, buff. Everything's calibrated with Sonarworks. Job done. Would I rather have the Kali IN5s in there? You bet your fucking bottom dollar would. Uh, but, you know, it is what it is. It needs must. And at the end of the day, my situation was either build Atmos on a budget or don't do Atmos at all and basically change it into a drum room. Because I was going to have that as a drum room and that as a separate live room and find a way of linking them all together. Which I probably could have. But I think I, in the end, I made the right decision because the Atmos side of it is giving me, from a business perspective, a USP. My unique selling point for, in Scotland just now is the Dolby Atmos. I'm getting so many people messaging me wanting to visit the studio. I even had a client in, but we're going to do a stereo album. And I took him in the Atmos room. And in my head, I was like, because he knows his stuff. And I was like, is he going to be a bit iffy about this because they're Cali LP8s? But he was blown away by it. And it was more my ear and it was more about like how I heard Dolby Atmos and because I did a good job treating the room and calibrating it. Like, even my sub, I managed to fix the sub issue in the room. That room is completely flat. <laughs> it's so, so well treated. And I was able to talk about Dolby Atmos in a way that made sense to him. I was like, I don't like this, but I like this. Listen to how they did this and listen to how they did that. See how they did this and that and that. And he was like, oh yeah, I could hear it. So I've never been this excited about music in years, Paul. And it only took 45 minutes in that Atmos room with me showing him mixes and talking about it in my room. It only took that amount of time for him to say, right, we're doing the entire album Atmos and you're doing it 100% Paul. I trust your ear. I trust the setup. We are doing Dolby Atmos. And I wouldn't have had that opportunity if I would have let those kind of audio kind of shaming niggles in the back of my head get to me. The most important thing to think about is what you need to make music. What do you need to finish a mix and what are your hurdles what are your priorities hopefully from this video what you can see is that it's not about how expensive things are it's not about how you are perceived it's about what makes you work more efficiently and effectively that's why many people invest in things like rme because the drivers are rock solid that's why many people go with certain plug-in manufacturers because they know 10 years down the line, they're still going to be able to use those plugins because they're still supported. Expensive gear is a luxury, right? They're a luxury. A lot of the pros that have expensive gear were able to have that luxury because they put in the hard work. And if you speak to a lot of these professional industry engineers, they'll tell you that they started off on fucking shitty Tascam recorders and they started out off with shitty monitors and they worked their way up. But it seems to be the modern way is start off with the most expensive stuff that you can afford and then learn how to mix. No, do it the opposite way. Right, just like buy what you can afford, don't get yourself in debt, learn the craft and then over time just slowly like work on your setup. And you've got to remember that the reason that many people online will try and shame you for your budget setup is because they've invested so much money in a setup that probably from the sims of it they've invested in because they are trying to rely on that to make them a better engineer, to be more professional. The professionals that I speak to don't even think about the gear. They think about this. They think about their noggin. They think about their experience. They mix. They work with artists. They just want to walk in to a studio, have three mixes on that day and rattle them out, send it to the client and that's it. They can work day to day. At the end of the day, it's all of a balancing act. Yes. There are times where you do need to invest to get better results. You know, that's why I invested in the Topping DX7 Pro Plus. I do believe that over time you should invest in your microphones. You should always invest in your monitoring. If you can treat your room better, then again, always go back to your room and try and treat your room better. If you can upgrade your monitoring, then yeah, definitely always do that. Uh, but just don't get yourself into debt, okay? I know that myself <laughs> for this fucking studio. But there you have it. My name's Paul Third. Hopefully it's helped you in some way or form. <laughs> I don't know if my waffling does, but uh, there you have it. 
There's a glimpse in my studio. That's me for this week. And I will see you whenever I see you.